Hi there, I'm Danny Henderson, and my brilliant genius guest today is none other than Andrew Collins, science and historical writer. We're here to talk about a lot of things, but one of the things we're going to talk about is his new book. He's written over 20, but this is his newest book, and it's called The First Female Pharaoh. So Beck Neferu, so excited, cannot wait to talk about this beautiful book. Andrew Collins, welcome. You're a legend, not just in my lunchtime, but in millions of other people. How are you? Well, thank you for that wonderful intro, uh, Danny. Yes, um, yes, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm here in England. It's a little cold, um, but, um, you know, uh, re ready and raring to go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the first female pharaoh is a project that I've wanted to write for a, a long time. Um, I mean, as far back as the 1980s, I became really interested in this woman who seemed to have been totally overlooked in Egyptian um, history. Uh, and yet she was the first person to actually officially wear the crowns of both Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, she ruled about 1800 BC, uh, and this was just before a very traumatic period in Egyptian history, a dark age, if you like, known as the Second Intermediate Period. And even though her reign was only uh, four years in length and very um, eventful, as we'll, we'll talk about, if it had not have been for her, for her reign, there's a good chance that Egypt would have fallen. Uh, at this time and probably just become another vassal state of Canaan, um, particularly as, you know, after her time, um, the whole place was taken over by these people that came in called the Hyksos, who are the these Asian warlords that basically took over uh, the northern part of Egypt and also had control in other parts of it as well. Um, and this left a, a, a dynasty trying to keep alive uh, Egyptian nationalism, which she basically founded, um, who followed in her footsteps, venerated the same god as her, who, which was Sobek, uh, the crocodile god, um, and managed to pass their torch on to the next dynasty, which was the 17th. Um, and they rose up against uh, the Hyksos and drove them out of Egypt. And thereafter began the most celebrated period of Egyptian history, which is known as the, um, the New Kingdom which began with the 18th dynasty. And within that, you've got all the great kings like, um, you know, Tutankhamun, Thotmosis, Ramesses, and all the rest of it, you know, would, 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 would come during this new kingdom period. So, as I said, it's what she did during her reign that changed everything. So, you know, well, what did she do? Well, to start off with... Um, when Before she came to the throne, it was her brother that was um, uh, the pharaoh, and he ruled for about a decade. And it would seem as if his idea was to follow on from something that their, their father had started, which was basically to open the borders um, to Asian Asiatic peoples uh, coming in. And what happened was that the Asiatic peoples became stronger and stronger um, and the Egyptians um, started to use a, lose a certain amount of control um, over their borders and what was going on. And there seemed to be quite a lot of foreign influence in the, the decision making, particularly, as I said, with her brother. Um, and it would seem as if there were certain factions within Egypt that were saying, you've got to stop this, you know, that this is going to lead to absolute disaster if, if you know, if the policies are not changed. Um, but he wouldn't. Um, but then he mysteriously disappears and she appears on the throne. Um, yeah. And I think that basically what happened was that um, that he was he was murdered, mm. um, you know, almost certainly uh, with her knowledge, uh, whether she was directly or indirectly involved, I don't know. Um, and the outcome of that was that she took over the throne. Uh, and she did change all the policies um, and, you know, created a much stricter, more nationalistic um, regime um, and basically was also able to, you know, to start a, a new dynasty um, during her reign, which was um, the 13th. You know, she, 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 her brother and her father were part of the 12th dynasty, which was a very, very successful dynasty. But as I said, the whole thing ends in 
you know, in a situation where she not just propped up Egypt, but, you know, reignited a flame which needed to be kept alive so that eventually when the Egyptians, re you know, found themselves in a strong enough place, they could raise an army and take back the country. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And I think that without her reign, if her brother had continued on, I think that Egypt would have collapsed, basically. So, you know, and the strange thing is, is that if that had happened, what would our world be like now? You know, if, if there was, you know, no Ramesses, no Cleopatra, mm. um, you know, no Egyptian influence, no Hermetica, nothing. I mean, you know, what would our world be like today? I mean, we don't know. Yeah, maybe the same, but I think the chances are it would have been an awful lot different. Uh, we certainly wouldn't have had the Art Deco period anyway, uh, because obviously all that, all of that came as a result of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, uh, and he was one of the, um, the the new kingdom, 18th dynasty kings. Um, so that was it, really. But I mean, that's that's the very basics of it. But there's a lot more. Um, I mean, to start off with. Um, once this new kingdom began, it would seem as if there was a certain amount of embarrassment about how Egypt had almost been, um, you know, destroyed um, during this Dark Age period, as I said, the second inter intermediate period. So it seemed as if that firstly, her tomb was completely um, forgotten about, basically, and you know, to such a degree that people were going to, you know, to, to other tombs that didn't belong to her to some, to venerate her, to venerate her memory, because it's quite clear that nobody knew where she was buried anymore. Um, and this is something that probably occurred very quickly after her death. In fact, it, it's almost certain that um, she was buried, she was buried in secret. Um, and from what I can ascertain, and we can go into why, uh, I think that she was, she had actually committed suicide. Um, and I think that the reason for this is that eventually what she was trying to achieve, which on a more religious side, more than political, um, was something that riled up a lot of the rival priesthoods. Um, and, you know, one in particular, which was the, pre the, um, the priesthood of, of Re or Ra, the sun god, Heliopolis, would seem to have... Um, taken umbrage over this whole thing and i think that you know they were very much um in the pocket of her brother uh whose name was amen emmet the fourth um you know he was dedicated to 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 you know to their particular temple their god um artum who was a form of the god ra um you know he 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 saw this as his personal god whereas she turned her back for the most part on the priests of Re, you know, the whole sun god, all the rest of it, right. and essentially created her own religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was essentially revolving around the um, the, the crocodile, crocodile god Sobek, um, of which that's her name. Her name actually means the beauties of Sobek. And Sobek is, as I said, a crocodile. And her, his mother, Sobek's mother, is the great mother goddess whose name is Neith. Uh, she's an incredibly ancient goddess of, of Egypt. Um, and her form was as a hippopotamus. And the two are shown together as a hippopotamus standing up with a crocodile on the back of the hippopotamus. Uh, and this is not only the way that it's depicted in ancient texts, but also within the sky, because there is a, a particular sky figure of the northern sky that seems to be made out of three different constellations. Um, Draco, the, the great dragon or serpent of the northern sky. Ursa Minor, um, which is like the sort of a, a, like a mini form of Ursa Major, the um, you know, the, what we call, uh, what do we call it over here? Um, the plough. Um, I can't remember what they call it in America at the moment. And these three different constellations would seem to have formed part of this sky figure. And the important thing about it was that it was the turning point of the heavens so that it like regulated the passage of time. Um, and what she did was to create a whole entire religion 
around this and centre it in the area of Egypt known as the Fayum Oasis, which is about 60 miles to the southwest of Cairo. Um, and here, what she did was she transformed her father's funerary complex, which was attached to you know, his pyramid, into this incredible structure, probably one of the most magnificent um, monuments in the whole of Egypt. Certainly that's the way that the classical writers would later talk about it, which has come down to us under the name the Labyrinth, the, ellipse, the, the Egyptian Labyrinth. Um, and it would seem that this was a massive, you know, complex of which there were at least 42 separate chapels, plus um, a huge underground area as well. And it would seem that what she did was to um, encourage the, um, the priests, the officials of all different 42 different um, districts or so-called noms of Egypt to come to the foam at least once a year so that they would venerate their own God. Now, you know, that God or goddess had its own name, but according to her religion, they were all part of Sobek. Sobek was their spirit, their soul. So they had to come to venerate Sobek in the labyrinth. Um, so in other words, you know, she was virtually creating an almost a monotheistic religion essentially mm -hmm. um and of course as i said this is going to seriously upset various of the the priesthoods you know this and the fact that she was going against this open borders policy which her brother had adopted um which was allowing you know many thousands of asiatic peoples to settle in the country many of which had risen to become you know everything from Court officials, they're in, you know, they're in armies, they're in the, the navy, they were um, you know, courtiers of different types, you know, so they were they were gazing, gaining quite a, a bit of influence, but it would seem as if they were they they were affecting the decisions being made in association with Egypt. So, you know, she changed all of that, um, and as I said, probably kept Egypt alive. Mm, mm, incredible. A couple mm. of questions for you. Um, you mentioned at the start of our conversation um, the uh, the fact that um, she was able to wear the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. Yeah. Can you yeah. Quick, briefly explain to people that might not know what that means and how come that was even possible? Yeah, I mean, basically, Egypt is in two parts. Um, what we call um, Upper Egypt, which is the southern part of the country, and Lower Egypt, which is the northern part of the country. And there's a demarcation between the two of them. Uh, and normally this was in the area of Memphis, which was the, the, the capital city um, of the, the northern part of the country <clears throat> from very earliest times, throughout the whole period of the Pyramid Age, whatever. And um, But what happened was that this demarcation between Upper and Lower Egypt was changed by her own family, um, members of her own dynasty, the 12th dynasty, to shift it further south to correspond with the latitude of the Fayum region. It was this huge fertile region. Um, and they basically created a new capital on this line, on this new demarcation. Um, and this was on the, um, the, the, the Nile. But if you went to the west of there, you would come to the Fayum Oasis, which is this huge, great lake, uh, which would come to be known as Lake Morris um, in Greek times. And this was where, you know, the 12th dynasty, the dynasty she was a part of, had established themselves. Um, and what she did was to create this labyrinth exactly on the point of demarcation or very close to the point of demarcation between Upper and Lower Egypt, like the point of balance. And as I said, there had been women who had risen to, um, you know, to certainly rule the country before her time, but most of this was unofficial. You know, in other words, um, that they, they, they were acting um, as regents, basically on behalf of, of a, a young child or maybe 
um, when their husband was 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 off on a campaign or something like that for a long period. You know, there is nothing before the time of Sobek Nofrares to suggest that anybody truly wore the, the both of those crowns because you know wearing both of those crowns was a symbol of the control of the whole of Egypt. I think that that's that's important and. Many of the pictures that you see of pharaohs, you know, they're wearing the double crown. There's like the flat crown um, of Upper Egypt and then the, the, the higher crown of, of Lower Egypt. I believe I've got it that way round. I'll need, we'll check afterwards. Um, and that's the symbol of kingship in Egypt, basically. So that was incredibly important to wear both of those crowns. Can't hear you. Pond <laughs> moment. Uh, we've learned from the time of um, Akhenaten and Nefertari, uh, Nefertiti, that um, they themselves created a singular, uh, you know, worshipful uh, presence. Uh, was this before or after Sebek Neferu? Yeah, I mean the Amarna period, which um, of which the the main pharaoh, of course, was Akhenaten, as you mentioned, and obviously his. Um, wife royal wife um was nefertiti they were around 1350 bc um sobek nefro ruled around 1800 bc so that's about 550 years earlier um but i think what's interesting is that obviously there are certain well-known female pharaohs of egypt um there is hatshepsut uh, I mean, she reigned um, around, uh, what, 1475 BC, that that time there. And there's no question that she role modelled, oh, sorry, you know, uh, uh, modelled her own um, reign on that of Sobek Nofru. There's a number of indications to suggest that she copied the style of of. of Sobek Nofru, not just in life, but also in death. I mean, there's evidence that the original sarcophagus of Hatshepsut um, had exactly the same um, inscriptions on it, you know, like funerary inscriptions, like, you know, the, 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 the words you would use to enter into the afterlife, as that on the sarcophagus, oh, sorry, the, the coffin, I should say, of um, Sobek Nofru's sister, whose name was Nefertar. Um, and yet the strange thing is, is that Nefertar's tomb was not discovered until the 1950s. And it was, you know, it was sealed. Um, and yet on Hatshepsut's Schutz's original sarcophagus, you have exactly the same uh, inscription or so close that it's very clear that, that, that she copied it from, uh, you know, this much earlier style. Um, which begs the question, why would you want to do that? I mean, this was something that was unique to her. Um, you know, and the only answer is that she must have got hold of the texts, you know, that, that were used by the family of Sobek Nofru and deliberately used them herself, almost as if she wanted to align herself with, you know, Sobek Nofru Re and her family in death. Um, you know, that's how strongly hats that shook would seem to have um, wanted to be connected with Sobek Nofru. But then obviously you've got, you know, later female pharaohs, we obviously know about Cleopatra. And the important thing about Cleopatra is that we know that she committed suicide. Uh, and when we say suicide, I mean, we, we tend to look at it in terms of, of how somebody might commit suicide today. But for these people of the past you know that they wouldn't have seen it in terms of you know giving up life easily they, they, they'd have seen it in terms of a ritual death in other words a, a way that they could quite literally walk into the afterlife themselves um and there's good indications that that cleopatra for instance um probably used a cocktail of drugs you know, to, to kill herself. The whole idea about the old putting the asp to the arm and all the rest of it, uh, and her dying from a from a the the you know the the bite of a of a snake is has just never panned out basically. Mm. And it's it's a symbolic act. I mean, 
you know the 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 snake itself is sim is a symbol of magic and medicine it's a symbol also of the goddess isis um and so you know what's being indicated here is that medicine who what the symbol of which is is the the snake is being used in this process and as i said that there is evidence um, or certainly theories that have been put forward quite recently to suggest that Cleopatra used a cocktail of drugs which would have unquestionably taken her into a, a death trance, basically, mm. you know, which she would never have recovered from. But she would have seen that in terms of walking into the next world, you know, quite literally opening the doors. And all the indications from what I can determine is that Sobek Nofru Reed did exactly the same thing, that she also committed ritual suicide. Uh, and I find that interesting because then you have to ask yourself, is it possible that Cleopatra was simply mimicking Sobek Nofru? And although very little has been passed down to us about Sobek Nofru and her life, you know, in, in ancient text, we've, we've had to piece it together from what few pieces have been discovered by archaeologists or by you know historical literature or whatever um is that in dynastic times right the way through to the time of cleopatra uh, and she committed suicide i think it was in 30 or 31 B, uh, bc um is that sobek nofru would have been known about by the right people you know there would have been information even though there is evidence that her memory was suppressed definitely you know, she was left out of certain king lists, um, along with the, the, all of the, the kings of the second intermediate period. As of, and, 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 and her name is the first one to be missed out, as if, like, it all began with her. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like they blamed her for it when they shouldn't have been blaming for her. They should have been, you know, celebrating her as the person that kept Egypt alive. It was complete opposite so there is evidence that, that that her reign was definitely suppressed. This is amazing. So many things come to mind here. Now, we're told Cleopatra, being the, the last of 300 years, the Ptolemy's reign, yeah. she was the last, the final pharaoh herself. Interesting, we, we kind of begin and end with female uh, pharaohs. We're told yeah. that Cleopatra would experiment with cosmetics. She would drink paraffin-type um, ingredients mm -hmm. to make her eyes purple and do you think there's any possibility that these kind of, um, you know, things that she took to enhance her beauty uh, also potentially led to her death? Uh, probably not, because I would think that, I mean, she was integrally bound with the Temple of Isis. I mean, she was a devotee of Isis. I mean, you know, this is shown not only in the ancient text, but also in, you know, the, the way that she's depicted. She's shown with... with um, pendants, things like that, associated with the go that goddess. So she would have had the whole temple of Isis around her, basically. You know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, these were the people that, that understood medicine, you know, that the, 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 the priestesses of Isis, you know, were the, the, the those that you turn to, essentially, you know, for your knowledge of medicine. I mean, certainly on, from a female perspective. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, there were there were other gods like Asclepius uh, um, as well, uh, which was another, you know, god of the um, uh, of the Greek Hellenic period that was also associated with medicine. And that was also his cult was in Egypt. But, you know, he, there's no question that Isis was strongly associated with with medicine. And um, so I reckon that she'd have known exactly what to do. And I think that, you know, th these the, the, these pharaohs, they would unquestionably have been taking hallucinogenic uh, substances um, to connect with you know, the gods, the spirits, the ancestors. This would have taken place in uh, special rooms, um, you know, so-called adytons, which were like these sort of like shrines, essentially. And they would have been found in, um, in palaces, um, you know, um, and obviously in, in temples themselves, often they were underground, but essentially they, they were just special places where ritual activity could take place, you know, away from the obvious, you know, celebratory ceremonial nature of, of the main part of a temple. Um, 
So there's no question that Cleopatra would have had one of these, but so would Sobek Nofro. Mm -hmm. um, because even though um, the, the main palace was, a, was on the Nile itself, it would seem as if she spent a lot of her time at the um, the palace that was attached to the Temple of Sobek in the Fayum area itself. Um, and this, I think, well, it was it was on the Great Lake, all the rest of it would have probably been a bit much, much nicer place to be, you know, for her to, to celebrate the gods or whatever else that, 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 that they were doing, very close to the labyrinth as well. Mm -hmm. So in other words, official duties would have been done at the capital on the Nile, and then she'd have gone and stayed in the palace and done her own thing. And I think that this is probably where, you know, her shrine was. Um, and I think that almost certainly... The, the priests of Sobek would have been very closely associated with her reign. Um, and quite clearly, you know, she, she herself, she had to be associated with Sobek because her name was Sobek. You know, it was almost like she was born of that god. Um, and she also was the first pharaoh to actually use the actual image of the animal within her name. Um you know, which whereas previous to this time, um, the the pharaohs had only used hieroglyphs to spell out, you know, a particular deity, but she used the crocodile actually in her name. Which obviously the crocodile is a, a very fierce animal. Um, it, you know, it's one that is meant to be, you know, fearful to people. And there's no question that she would have used this to her advantage. Um, I think she wanted to come across as quite a fierce, ruthless person and she had to you know there's no way that she could have um, ascended the throne unless she was seen to be you know as hard as they possibly come basically mm -hmm. um now that not is not necessarily the way she was but she had to come across that way to keep control because if if she if she would if she did not come across as like a roaring lion or a crocodile mm -hmm then there would be people that would take her out. It's as simple as that. They, they would see her as weak. They would conv convince others that she was weak and they would destroy her reign. Mm. And of course, obviously, I think this is what happened towards the end is that, you know, people saw the way that she was changing the country, changing the direction, both politically, but also from a religious point of view. And they said, look, you know, look what this woman's doing. And unfortunately, what happened is that in the third year of her reign, the waters of the Nile started to fail um, and there was an extremely low flood in that year. You know, in other words, the waters that were coming down from the mountains of Central Africa, uh, the meltwaters or the monsoon you know, rains that would bring down those waters into Egypt on the, uh, on the annual inundation. Um, they started to fail. Now, we've only got a record for her third year. We don't know what was going on in her fourth year or first or second, but we do know that prior to that time, they'd been much higher. And if they are too low, what it means is there's not enough water to plant the seeds and for them to grow. Um, you know, because what happens is that with the inundation, it brings in and this huge mud, this black mud that, that, that covers the low-lying regions of the Nile and, and the Fayum region, you know, the canal that took the waters right up into the Fayum. And this is was brought with it all the nutrients that were needed to, to grow and cultivate, um, you know, the, the plants, the domesticated plants and grains and whatever for the, for the next season. Um, and if that failed then, you know, there could quite easily, um, you know, uh, be a point where, you know, quite obviously people would starve. And this was all put down to the Pharaoh and their relationships to the gods and the goddesses. So in other words, if their relationship with them was failing, then this, this is what would happen. You'd get a famine like this. And it's interesting that, it would seem as if, if that was happening, the monarch would be expected to either put it right very quickly or commit suicide. 
And I find that very, very interesting. Wow. Because, it, you know, in other words, it would seem as if later kings committed suicide um, because of the famines and the crops were failing. And I think that this was one of the things that, that the, the, the priests, particularly those, as I said, of the sun god Ra, were saying, look, look what this woman's doing. You know, everything was fine when her brother was 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 raining. Now, look, you know, we're getting we're getting famines. And this was another nail in her coffin, quite literally, to be honest. Now, I mean, clearly it's not her fault. <laughs> you, yeah. know, um, you know, with what rains uh, fall, you know, in the mountains and wash down into Egypt as part of the, the annual inundation. But unfortunately, a reign of a king, you know, is bound up with the land itself. You know, the whole Arthurian idea of the king and the land are one. Yeah, you know, this this is true. You know, the idea of divine kingship is something that goes back many, many thousands of years and was certainly there in Egypt as well. So this was just another thing compounding the problems at the end of her reign. But she'd done enough to create this new dynasty, the 13th dynasty, who were loyal to her. And also many of many of the kings, their names were Sobek, their Sobek, their Sobek Hotep. Um, which basically meant sort of the servants of Sobek, which means that they were clearly also followers of Sobek and followed the temple of Sobek. In other words, you know, they were her supporters and it would seem as if they created a cult in her name that lasted almost certainly through until the New Kingdom and kept her memory alive, but in very strange and in odd ways, which I show in the book. Right. Um, in terms of her... Her, when she came to take power after the disappearance or murder, elimination of her brother, yeah. um, what was the general thinking of women in such a position at that time? Well, I, I think that, you know, things had been changing even before her reign because her father, Amenemet the, the third, was an incredibly successful um, king. And it would seem as if he was lining up her sister, Nefertar, to reign jointly with her brother, Amenemhat the Fourth. Now, some people suggest that you know that Amenemhat the Fourth may not have even been a, pro a proper brother. Maybe he was an adopted brother or something like this. I I think that they they all had the same father, but there may have been different mothers involved. Um, so the idea of a female ruler would seem to have come from her, from Sobek Nofru's father. But what happens is that when Nefertar, um, Sobek Nofru's sister, reaches the age of, I would estimate, between 16 and 18, based on the size of a coffin, and I go into detail about how she couldn't possibly have been any older and almost certainly no younger, um, she 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 dies. I mean, how exactly she dies, we don't know. Um, she was initially put in the pyramid of her father. They actually created a makeshift sarcophagus next to that of her father. And it looks as if they both died very, very close together. First her, then the father. But what happened was that... that this Nefertar, the, you know, the sister of Sobek Nofri, she was also having her own smaller pyramid being constructed at this time. And this was finished, and her body was then transferred from her father's pyramid into her own smaller pyramid and in the Fayum, and that, that this was sealed and was not discovered until not uh, in the mid 1950s that's when it was you know that the tomb was discovered the, the the pyramid around it had gone but the actual tomb was still completely sealed and locked underground so for some reason the sister disappears dies suddenly now you know again without getting too conspiratorial minded who was the only person that would benefit by uh, the sister disappearing. And of course, that was Sobek Nofru, because, I mean, she would seem to have started her life as a priestess. I mean, all the indications are that she 
um, had taken that route that she was destined uh, probably to become a priestess of a, a temple. Uh, I say this, uh, various other commentators have, have suggested, sorry, bouncing everything about, uh, that there's evidence that 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 this was her route, this, this was going to be her role in life. And if her sister was older than her, then there was no way that she could um, really become, you know, Pharaoh. And there's a good chance that she accepted that. Um, and then obviously when it, 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 you know, it was announced that her brother would marry her sister and that any child that they would have would clearly become the next king. Sobitnofri was clearly well out of the running. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then suddenly her sister disappears. And what happens next, I think, is that Sobek Nofruri takes her sister's place next to her brother. I think that the two of them were very close at the start of his reign, very, very close, because it would seem as if two pyramids were constructed at this time, a place called Mezguna, just south of Dashur. And one was going to be for him and one was going to be for Sobek Nofru. Um, so that they were very close and they were almost certainly ruling together, even though there's no absolute, um, you know, written evidence of this. It, it doesn't seem as if they're close, but somehow the relationship between brother and sister broke down very soon into her brother's Amenemonek, the false uh, reign. So they, 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 they went in different ways. And as I say, her brother became incredibly um what's the right word um open-minded relating to the borders and you know uh, becoming a cosmopolitan nation whereas people i think were coming to the sister who had you know had started to rule with him and said look your brother's taking the country in the wrong direction and only disaster will come if we continue down that route. And of course, you know, all of those worries were true because Egypt did fall shortly after that. You know, the, the Hyksos kings came in, they took over, um, you know, certainly the north part of the country. They trashed most of the rest of it, um, just leaving this, this little puppet dynasty in the south of the country in Thebes, the 13th dynasty. So all of these worries were justified in fact you know some writers have even suggested that you know that the, the, the family may have even had premonitions of what was about to come and I find, I find that a very interesting statement it's almost as if they knew that Egypt, Egypt was about to fall and then suddenly you know Sobek Nofru is, is, is reigning here and I think that behind her was a nationalistic group um, you know, ones that, that that didn't like this open borders policy and said that it's going to only cause disaster to Egypt. And I think that what happened was that they said to her, look, we'll sort it out, providing that you help us. And if we can get rid of your brother, you know, we will support you and make sure that you become the next pharaoh. You know, you've already shown that, that you can rule the country with your brother. We will support you. And I think that's exactly what happened. Amazing. So her Amazing. brother was, was murdered. And it wouldn't surprise me if uh, her sister was murdered as well. Yeah, how kings and queens are made. I was going to ask you about the influences around Sebek Neferu. Uh, I wanted to know also, what do we know about her mother? But then go go to who were the people who were her guidance? Were any of the people who were her guidance, do we know also at one point guiding her brother? Because it doesn't sound like that would yeah. be a situation given yeah. what Sarah right. Well, it, okay. right. Well, the mother of her sister would seem to have been different to the mother of Sobek Nofru and her brother Amenemet the Fourth. Um, now we know this. We, we certainly know that Sobek Nofru had a brother, and her brother uh, was the king. 
because of Manetho. Manetho is the, um, the chronicler that set down the dynasty of kings. Um, I think he lived around um, 250 to 300 BC. Um, and it's from him that we have this whole chronicle of the kings of the different dynasties. And he says very clearly that, that Sobek Nofru was the, the sister of the previous king, Amenemet the fourth. So we, we know that. But as far as his mother, his mother is mentioned in a temple, a place called Medanit Mardi on the south side of the Fayum. And it's the only place that she's mentioned, just one mention. Her name is Hetepti, if I remember rightly. Excuse me if I'm getting that slightly wrong. Um, and so if that's his mother, it must be hers as well. OK. I, there is a, another woman in the frame for her sister's mother. So in other words, there are at least two mothers involved here. I think that's the, that's the correct way. And that what happened was that father, um, the, the first, his first royal wife probably died, I would have thought, and he took a second one. And he had the two younger children, Sobek Nofra and her brother, after that. That's why the rule would have gone to her elder sister, because she was obviously, you know, first in line. But because she was a woman, it was felt that if the brother, the half brother, was brought in and they ruled together, this would this would make for an idealistic situation. That's what seems to have happened. But as I said, the sister Nefertar never reached that position. She died just before she would have become the joint ruler of Egypt. And the thing is, we know that she was being lined up to become Pharaoh is because her name was actually being shown inside a cartouche. And the only this is the first time that, uh, that a person who was not a Pharaoh actually had their name in a cartouche. And certainly the first time that a woman had her name in a cartouche prior to actually reigning. So, you know, in other words, it's clear that she was being lined up for that role. And then, as I said, she disappears. Or when I say disappears, she dies, you know, at the age of 16 to 18, I would say. Um, and, you know, Sobek Nofru steps in her shoes, literally. Mm. Um, and as I said, she rules initially with her brother, I think. They fall out. Um, and, you know, they that they both go in different directions. And obviously each one has got their supporters, you know, their, their own priesthoods, you know, their own political advisors or the rest of it. And they were both at odds as far as which way the country was going. Um, and that's why I think the brother was bumped off and Sobek Nofru Re was supported through until she couldn't take it any further. And so she then, dies almost certainly through ritual death and that's that but what we should talk about is her legacy really and, and and you know where some of this information is coming from because there is not much within ancient egyptian literature to give us many clues other than as i said through what archaeology can tell us um, what little we can see from the inscriptions on the walls and whatever but there are some legendary figures, and one of these is a legendary female ruler by the name of Nitocris. Um, and she's first mentioned by the Greek historian Herodotus in around 450 BC. And the story is that her brother, the king, it doesn't give his name, it says her brother, the king, was ruling and he was murdered. And she decided that she would bring together all those she suspected of, you know, of being complicit in her brother's mur murder, bring them together for this huge banquet um, and then let the waters come in from, from presumably the Nile to drown all these people, right? That This is the, the, the you know, the, the vengeance, this is what's known of, of Nitocris. But it then says that so that 
she herself would then not be murdered. She she repairs into this room full of of hot ashes and dies. Hmm. And I mean, you know, I mean, this is a strange story, which we'll come back to in a second. But a lot of people who know anything about Egyptian history say, yes, well, I know about Nita Chris, but she reigned in the Sixth Dynasty. That's a long time before Sobek Nofru. But this only comes from Manetho, the, the guy that did the, the chronology of the kings from about 250 to 300 BC. And it can be shown that she never existed. There is no female king in the Sixth Dynasty. And this was, um, you know, this was proved in the year 2000 by a very studious archaeologist um, and Egyptologist by the name of Kim Reichholt. Um, and he showed there's this, this thing called the, the Turin Canon. It's a canon of kings, right? And previously people had seen a name and they thought, oh, look, that looks like Nia Chris. That's obviously her. This confirms she exists. But what he proved is that this was a known king and a male king. There's no question about this, a male king. And if that's the case, then Nina Chris never existed. And there's no place that she could have possibly existed. No evidence has ever come out of her of, of, for, of, of her reign, ever. But what I show in the book is that the way that Nita Chris is introduced in Herodotus is very clearly within the 12th dynasty period associated with Sobek Nofru Re. You know, the, the order of the kings that are talked about around her in exactly the same chapters that follow her are all in the order of the kings of the 12th dynasty. And even though they've got slightly different names, you know, they've been identified as the kings. And in other words, you know, if you're, you're, if you're following that order, the next one, you know, would be um, Amenemet the Fourth, you know, her brother the king, and then Sobek Nofru Re. It's very clear that Sobek Nofru Re is Naito Chris. So if that's the case, then A, this tells us that her, her brother was murdered. Um, secondly, that she took revenge on those people that she thought had murdered them. And then thirdly, she committed suicide herself. Now that you might say, well, hold on, you know, clearly somebody else murdered her brother, but I don't think so. I think that what happened, um, and again, I provide evidence for this, is that I think that she covered up the death of her brother by taking out whoever she wanted at, after it by basically saying, right, so who killed him? You, 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 and you, you're all going to die, basically. And, you know, in other words, got rid of any, any, any opposition to her reign. And this whole thing about the hot ashes, to me, this is this special time, the Adderton, you know, this, this special shrine. And I think it was all to do with incense burning. And that incense had within it hallucinogenic substances that would have taken her into a complete altered state, a trance state that would eventually have led to her death. I mean, quite easily, uh, you know, if you use an amount which is beyond that, which would have been recommended, you, you know, you would die. It's as simple as that. And if you use exactly the right cocktail, you're going to get high first and eventually you're going to die, basically. You are just going to fall into sleep. It's amazing. So many stories of, um, of, of the way that they use hallucinogenics. Um, I, when I went to Luxor, I believe I was at the Temple of Karnak, and uh, it was explained to me by this guide who'd gone from many generations of family being a guide, you know, so he had all the downloads on everything, things that I've never heard of or read about in, in the yeah. Western world. And there was an area where he said, right, see this grill on the ground? There was a grate that had a big hole under it. He said they would get the king, the pharaoh, stoned, bring him onto that grill, and the monks underneath would be hollering up you know, and chanting what he needed to hear and know and believe himself to be the God of all gods. And, you know, I, I fully believe based on lots of other texts like that. So, but what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I mean, I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, but I mean, what we're talking about here is advisors. And this brings us into another interesting area. Uh, and that's the fact that there's a crossover here with biblical tradition and the book of Genesis. Is it the book of Genesis? Yes, it is. Yeah. And that's the story of Joseph. Now, it's long been suggested that if the figure of Joseph, you know, he of the the, the, the technicolored coat, um, you know, being abandoned by his brothers, you know, uh, and then sold into slavery in Egypt, and then rising up to become, you know, Pharaoh's uh, right hand, um, you know, man advising him when this the famines came, all the rest of it, that all of this occurred during the reign of Sobek Nofru's father, Amenemet the third. Um, now, I mean, my colleague David Rowe wrote about this in, in his books, and I think he's absolutely correct. Uh, and I found further evidence of this uh, it, during the writing of my books, because in addition to the Bible itself, there are various Arab texts that, although they only date to the medieval period, they are quite clearly based on Coptic stories and originals um, that go back probably to the time of, you know, the time of Christ and therefore almost certainly to the dynastic age. And they tell us more about what Joseph was up to um, and how he actually created palaces in the Fayoum area, as well as these canals, um, you know, the huge hydraulic works, engineering works, all the rest of it. And what's so interesting is that it talks about these palaces being built for Pharaoh's daughter, um, and all the indications are that although she's not being mentioned in terms of a pharaoh, I am certain this is Sobek Nofro. And that obviously the father here is obviously her father, Amenemet the, the third. And then when that father dies, another king takes over, who is quite clearly her brother. And, and as I said, her memory as a pharaoh was suppressed. So even though they can't write a completely out the story, so they call her Pharaoh's daughter, um, you know, she's there, her, you know, she, she's still within that story. Um, so, you know, here she is. But the question then comes is, did Sobek Nofru know um, Joseph? You know, in other words, if, I mean, if he was the advisor, not only of her father, Amenemet III, but also, according to the accounts, the next king, her brother. So if, if he was an advisor to her brother, then was she also the advisor to, to Sobek? Was he also the advisor to Sobek Nofro? I mean, David Rowe says that he, he that, that Joseph was, that he was still alive during Sobek Nofro's reign and may have even been alive in the reigns of the, the, the king, the first two kings of the next dynasty, which I think is possible. Um, and the important thing here is that the Bible tells us that Joseph was aligned to the temple of Ra at Heliopolis. Um, it was uh, in in the Bible. Um, Heliopolis is called On O N, just O N. Um, in other words, he was aligned with the priests of Ra. In other words, and they were the people that we know to be aligned with her brother. You know, he his her brother. Um, you know, in personal inscriptions and the rest of it, bigged up Artem Ra, you know, the, the main god, the main creator god, um, the main creator form of, of the sun god Re. That was his personal god. Not Sobek. You know, Sobek had been important to their father and their people, you know, their, their, their the kings before that. But he was not interested in that. He wasn't even interested in the Fayum. What her brother wanted to try and do was set up a new kingdom outside of Egypt itself in the Sinai, um, based around this religious centre called Serabat el Kadam, um, which was um, dedicated for the most part to the goddess um, Hathor. And um, both the father and her brother, you know, would go to this temple and pay their respects or certainly get officials to pay their respects on, on, on their behalf, basically. Um, so in other words, her brother had turned his back completely on, you know, this, this heart of Egypt, you know, and I think this was another thing that 
that that gave Sobek Nofri so much support is because clearly through her name, Sobek, she was supporting the the the, the, the Sobek priesthood of the Fayum region. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there is a case that Sobek Nofru knew Joseph. And if that's the case, then, you know, we can only imagine the conversations that would have been going on between her and him. You know, it may well be, and I, I sort of, you know, muse over this in the book that, you know, maybe he, he actually came to her after the death of her brother and said, look, you know, unless you change your policies, you realise that, you know, it's, it's going to go badly for you. Um, and, you know, she obviously thought about it for a moment and said, no, nope, we're continuing the way that, that we are. And of course, within, you know, a couple of years, she, she, she herself was, was gone basically, but that's it really. But I know we're probably getting on with our hour here, but the other important thing is that very little was known about her because of, we you know, archeology span only really comes into its own in the 19th century until this time and once we start to read the hieroglyphics you know a few mentions of her name crop up so it's like well who is this woman yeah she seems to be you know a um a, a female ruler um and they got the name Sobek Nofru who is she Manetho talks about this female ruler called Skimifris um and they put the two together, they're obviously the same person, right? So in other words, you know, yes, she was a pharaoh. But what's so interesting is that it was quite clear from the early days that she, that she was a very interesting woman doing very, very different things. She was creating her own religion, um, which was almost monotheistic. Um, you know, she created a cult so that the, the all of the kings, that, well, not all, but many of the kings of the next dynasty all bore the name Sobek, you know, directly after her. You know, she cr clearly created this religious cult. And this interested um, certain Egyptologists, particularly a guy called Heinrich Bruch. Um, and, you know, he wrote about this in the books. And it was picked up on by a more speculative um, writer of ancient history by the name of Gerald Massey. Um, and he wrote some incredible books on the more mystical side of, of ancient, 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 Egyptian, Egyptian, the idea of this hippopotamus and Sobek and all the rest of it. And, you know, he basically focuses in on Sobek and says, look, this woman revived this incredibly ancient cult of Egypt. Um, and this obviously continued in her name one form or another thereafter. And, this, it would seem, interested the writer, the Irish writer of Dracula, Bram Stoker, um, because Gerald Massey's books were being read by a lot of occultists in the Victorian period, particularly in London, where he lived. Um, and these occultists belong to an order called the Golden Dawn. Um, and one of their members was a lady called Florence Farr, an actress uh, and playwright um, and, and an author of books on ancient Egypt as well. And she started channeling this ancient Egyptian female, um, which she called the Egyptian contact. I mean, now, it wasn't Sobek Nofru, but what happened was that she started saying that, that this guide is telling me we've got to do this, we've got to do that. And it really seriously started upsetting the other members of the Golden Dawn. And she founded a separate group within the Golden Dawn called the Sphere to try and, you know, bring out all of this, this stuff to do with the Egyptian contact. And it caused such controversy that, um, that it was virtually seen as evil, basically. And what I think was that all of this was, was coming back to, to, to Bram Stoker, and he brought it all together to create an Egyptian novel called The Jewel of Seven Stars, which was um, released in 1903. Um, and so shocking was the end of this book that the publishers turned around to Bram Stoker and said, you've got to change this. And, and the book basically has this woman being taken over by this Egyptian, you know, female pharaoh. I mean, all right, she, she's not called... So about Nofru, she's called um, Tira, Terra. It's quite obviously a play of words. Um, 
And the, at the end, she gets totally taken over and disappears and the rest of it. And, and it, it's quite dramatic, certainly for the, the post-Victorian, you know, uh, era. Um, so he did change it. He did change it for sub subsequent editions. But the reason why I'm going on about this is that his story of the Jewel and Seven Stars, Jewel and Seven Stars, would become the role model for every film that would come out from that point onwards where a, where a Egyptian royal female resurrects from the grave and, and wreaks havoc in the world, basically, um, of which the latest version of that was 2017's The Mummy, um, featuring Tom Cruise. Um, it's all they're all based on Bram Stoker's book. And if they're based on Bram Stoker's book, they're based on Sobek Nofru. You know, so she's she is the role model for 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 that that particular character. Um and you know, the other thing is in the occult world, there's a uh, writer no longer with us by the name of Kenneth Grant, wrote a series of books bigging up uh Sobek Nofru in it, basically saying that she was the you know, the creator of this this very ancient cult to do with the stars. Um, and for that reason, occultists all over the world see Sobek Nofru as you know, a very important character in their their, their history of, of magic and, and the occult. You know, and, and there's even a, a guy by the name, again, no longer with us, named Nicholas de Vere. Um, and he wrote various books on what he called the Dragon Kings or the Grail Dynasty of, of kings that, were, that went all the way from ancient Egypt right the way through to, to the modern day, you know, in, in Europe, Eastern Europe and whatever. And the progenitor of all of these he had as Sobek Nofra. Um, so in other words, she was the creator of the, the Grail Dynasty, basically. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that, you know, this this is this is the influence that this woman has had in an almost unconscious way. But now, obviously, with me writing this book for the first time, this is the first biography ever of Sobek Nofru. And all of this is in there. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, it, it's enough to bring her back again. Uh, you know, certainly in the sense of her immortality, you know, because you have to say to yourself, you know, the, the, the kings of ancient Egypt were trying to gain immortality. That was the whole idea of the tombs, the pyramids, you know, all the subscriptions of the, on the walls going into the afterlife and whatever. And the question then becomes, what is immortality? You know, and, and did these kings achieve it? Well, you think of Tutankhamun. Before 1922, when his tomb was discovered, we knew nothing about Tutankhamun. I mean, a couple of tiny artifacts had been found to suggest that there was a king of this name that followed, you know, after Akhenaten. That was it. Had no more information about him whatsoever. And yet, when his tomb is discovered, he becomes one of the most famous pharaohs in the world. You know, possibly as famous as Ramesses or anybody like this. Yeah. And now he'll be immortal forever. It's like Nefertiti. I mean, you know, everybody knows the name of Nefertiti. Why do we know her name? Because of that bust, that bust that's in the Berlin Museum. The beauty of that bust is something which, you know, once you set eyes on it, you think this is an incredibly beautiful, but clearly a very important and powerful woman. And that gives her immortality and you know in other words somebody like Tutankhamun has achieved that immortality but with with Sobek Nofru she hasn't or hadn't until now and I think that very gradually she's living again and I think that you know I'm doing something to allow her to live again. That's pretty incredible I'm sure she's yeah, grateful sure to she's you great. beyond the grave. Um, we've I hope so. <laughs> interesting kind of paranormal little things happening the last few minutes um so that may well be a yeah. hello we Please have tell. 
indeed. Well, your <laughs> voice. Please, please tell. Well, I think if people start looking, the last few minutes of this, uh, there's been several orbs that just suddenly came out of nowhere. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and there was a stage where you leant back and I think you said the word ancient and it rattled three times in a row, like you were in between the bandwidth of the, the wow. Wi-Fi. Yeah. So, um, but no, it's wonderful. There are authors like you, historians, researchers, archaeological researchers that bring to life an aspect of that time that we're all so fascinated. Who mm. isn't fascinated with Egypt? I mean, it's really just, just remarkable. And what about what's happening now? What are your thoughts? I heard today they're closing down the main the main pyramids at Giza, maybe leaving one open. Yeah, uh, because I it's, heard of that. Because they found a tunnel. Um, I have friends who say that the tunnel they found, there's another one underneath. At the end of that tunnel, there's a chair. The chair has technology. Now, that hasn't come out publicly yet, but it will. So what are your thoughts on what's happening there right now? Um. Well, to be honest, um, I, I've not heard anything about this chair, I'll be honest. Um, but certainly the, the actual chamber is incredibly interesting. I mean, if you want to look at it in a very simplified form, it, it's a relieving uh, chamber for the entrance so that the, 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 the pressure is not on the top of the, of the entrance so that it doesn't collapse. But I'd like to think there's much more to it than that. You know, maybe there is something in it. Obviously, we've got photographs of it you know they put the little camera thing through um to, to get there and we got shots of it i don't know um i mean i think that there are various um unknown chambers to be found there um certainly one above the grand gallery as well which uh is almost certainly there um and who knows what we'll find in them um i mean i, I do subscribe to the fact that khufu was the builder of the great pyramid i don't believe that it was any older than than his time frame. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there is a magic and power associated with ancient Egypt, which I think is still with us today. I mean, you talk about some weird things going on. I like that. But what's also important is that a number of people have had strange experiences to do with Sobek Nofra across, across the years. Um, you know, I mean, full visitations of her in a way which is totally beyond any other, um, you know, pharaoh of Egypt, other than perhaps, you know, the Amarna period, Akhenaten, and Nefertiti, that, that period, the Amarna family. A lot of people have strange experiences and dreams and people um, believe that they have past lives, you know, during that time. But a number of very profound um, paranormal and psychic experiences have taken place involving Sobek Nofro. Um, she is a very, very powerful force. And I think that, you know, she she is out there. She does exist still. And, um, you know, if people's dreams and experiences are anything to go by, at least. Mm, amazing. Have you had any visitations in your dream time with her? Um, I mean, <laughs> not that we can go into on air, but um, all I will say is that as I was writing the book, you know, I did strongly sense her presence here and there, um, almost as if, you know, she wanted her story to come out. I mean, that that's that's what I'll say. That's so beautiful. Amazing. Well, Andrew Collins, sir, it has been a real pleasure to host you on my channel today. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I uh, really respect you and your work. And uh, you brought such a, a, a... It's very fun watching you. There's so many different TV shows that you've been on. And there's so much broadness of scope of your knowledge, different subjects. Um, is there anywhere in particular... But bearing in mind, I'm talking about the TV right now, just separately, not the book. Is there anywhere that you yeah. would like to encourage people to go watch you, like a plethora of, of enjoyable um, broadcasts that you do? Um, well, I mean, obviously, I've got a YouTube channel, which I'd like people to to search out if they can. It's just Andrew Collins. If you just put Andrew Collins, um, you know, somewhere like Karahan Tepe or Gobekli Tepe, my name will come up and you'll see my channel because uh, that's, you know, my other hat, if you like. Um You've got that, plus the website, andrewcollins.com, if people want to contact me about this subject, um, you know, please do. And that's that's the other thing I was going to say is I'm not an Egyptologist. I'm not even an academic. I mean, my background is journalism. And the Egyptologists, I mean, there is 
a, a forward in the book by an Egyptologist, a proper Egyptologist by the name of Jan Summers, who's been a big supporter of mine uh, for many years. But beyond that, we are getting a certain amount of pushback from Egyptologists about this book. You know, the fact that a non-academic is writing uh, about this subject, even though the book is as scholars, scholarly as you can possibly get it, I promise you. Um, so, you know, and this is about the first woman who becomes, you know, the king of Egypt, the first woman, you know, to become a pharaoh. I mean, this was this is a great achievement for women. And, you know, a, a, a lady contacted me and she said, look, it, it's easy for women to write about other women and about, you know, their achievements, you know. But you're a man and you've written about this and I applaud you for doing that. So thank you for doing that. And, and I thought, oh, that's really nice for somebody to say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I, the one thing I will say is that, you know, if people can help me to promote this book, I would appreciate it because it isn't going to be the most easiest of books of mine to promote. You know, if I do a book on Quebec Tepe in southeast you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just finishing a book now on Karahantepe, which is the greatest archaeological discovery of the 21st century. Um, that's the sister site of Gobekli Tepe. But, you know, that's easy to promote. Um, but but this book on the first female pharaoh is a little bit more out there as far as trying to promote it. So, you know... If people can help me in some way, even if it's just sharing your, you know, your wonderful interview with me, I'd appreciate it. Beautiful. Well, we'll certainly ask the audience to do that. And there's a lot that watch my channel who who love um, the the ancient information that you're bringing. Yeah. What are you going to say? Yeah. yeah, the other thing, I, I just the business end of the deal. Um, I, we we are going to Egypt in November. I say we. I mean myself, Hugh Newman, JJ Ainsworth, and the Megalithomania crew. Um, you can find full details of that. We're going in in November and we're going to various sites associated with Sobek Nofru. And, you know, we're going in quest of her tomb, as it were, you know, trying to understand where exactly she's buried, because that is still a mystery, by the way. She certainly was not buried in the pyramid that was that was built for her. Um, so, you know, that's that's in November. You can find full details of that on andrewcollins.com. Um, or on megalithomania.co.uk. Um, we're also going to Turkey. You know, we're going in May. That's fully booked. We're also going in um, September to Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, and all of the main sites in Egypt. So um, see that. And, yeah, that's it, really. So, you know, other than that, it's trying to finish this Karahan Tepe book, which is nearly done. Uh, the publishers will get it within the next few weeks. So, Are you excited to bring that out? Because it's just we don't know enough about well, it is. I mean, you know, every book I do, it's like I have to get it out now. And the, the, and the problem is, is that it takes a publisher a year to get it out. Um, I mean, this this Sobek Nofru book has been finished for well over a year. Um, and the book I'm doing now is not going to come out until next year. I mean, all right, the publishers have to put everything in place, get the gears rolling, everything. And I understand that. But it's frustrating. Of course it is. Um, and... With Cara Ham, because it is such an important discovery, I mean, you're talking here about a complex that's 11,000 years old that's aligned to galactic centre. I mean, it's just extraordinary stuff. I mean, it's mind-blowing. I mean, it, it just takes everything onto a different scale of our understanding of shamanism, religion, mysticism, magic, everything. Um, so that's the book that I've been writing at the moment. Um but as I said, at the moment, all focus on Sobek Nofru. So uh, uh, the book is called The First Female Pharaoh, Sobek Nef... So, so I'm saying it wrong myself now. Sobek Neferu, Goddess of the Seven Stars. So beautiful. I'll put all the details. Now. Huh? Available now from um, Amazon, Barnes and & Nobles and all good online bookshops <laughs> brilliant Doo -doo. uh well put all the details underneath and i was looking at your um your tour um, of gobekli tepe uh in may with yeah. Jane Ainsworth, and yeah. um you just mentioned that it's sold out already 
Well, the, the one for May is, I mean, that's only next month, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's so been sold out for a while. But, I mean, look, if people want to come with us to Turkey in, in September, I mean, these are voyages of discovery. They're not just, you know, holidays where you lie on the beach the whole time. I mean, you know, people make genuine discoveries on these. I mean, that can be changing. I mean, a, a few years ago, um, we discovered that, well, we didn't discover, we, dis we, we discovered that was on this, this bone plaque in a museum was T-shaped pillars that, you know, like you find at Gebekli Tepe. Um, this plaque actually had come from Gebekli Tepe and the archaeologists had not noticed it. And so myself, Hugh Newman did um, um, uh, videos, you know, on it that were put out. We did articles and the whole story went viral. I mean, to such a point that the archaeologists, you know, that were working on the site had to write their own articles to try and refute our discoveries and, you know, the rest of it. And this eventually led to me being banned from Quebecly Tepe. I mean, everything's good now, but uh, yeah, that's a long story. Yeah, Thank yeah. Goodness. I mean, I was nearly arrested going uh, um, with a tour group uh, in 2018 when I went there. Uh, and all of this really started with with the our discovery of the bone plaque with the um with the, the T pillars on. So it, it it upset an awful lot of people. So it's incredible, isn't it, how people feel they have a right to lay claim on something. But my channel fundamentally, why my, my byline is this is the channel to reveal the true history of our planet on and off planet. You know, because and if people don't do their job and bring information forward, others are going to yeah. do it. Others are going to do it. So well done you, well done you. Thank you well, so yeah, much. Well, yeah, but we say well done me. It wasn't me that found it. It was actually one of the tour group right. members. Right. You know, the strange thing was is that he just had his eyes lasered so that they were, you know, <laughs> they were perfect. I mean, I looked at this bone <laughs> a few times. I'd never noticed anything. But he saw it and he, and he just sort of turned around to us. He said, aren't they T-shaped pillars on that bone plaque? We said, we looked at, oh my God. I mean, it was T shaped pillars, you know, incised onto it. And wow. nobody had noticed. And the archaeologists, their official view was, oh, it must be the feet of an animal or something like that. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, there's two pillars with a figure in between them, and but behind that, another stone with a hole in it. I mean, it's so clear that it's as plain as day. But of course, the archaeology, because it was discovered by amateurs like us, oh no, no, can't possibly be that. It's got, it's got to be the feet of a, a lizard or something, you know? Ridiculous. Oh my God. But what, what I'm saying is that these tours are voyages of discovery. You know, you can change history by coming along on them. So uh, please do look at these up. As I said, they're on andrewcollins.com, all the details, or on uh, Hugh's. Hugh Newman's megalithomania.co.uk site. So, you know, and obviously Hugh and I uh, are on things like Ancient Aliens and uh, Gaia TV's um, Ancient Civilizations and uh, and Hugh's channel, Megalithomania. I mean, it's got dozens of really, really good videos on sites all over the world, basically. Um, you know, one, one of the best, I think, out there. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much, Andrew Collins. This was such a wonderful hour to spend with you learning about your new book and getting to know more about you as a person. You're welcome back on this channel anytime with any subject because my audience are so lovely and they're so intelligent and they love this kind uh, of, a, of a conversation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I will happily come back. Excellent. Thank you so much. And to you, the audience, thank you for being here with Andrew Collins and myself. My name is Danny Henderson. I will see you soon.